Okay, so a short recap of my uh, uh, previous LN2 session. So the uh, main spotlight was obviously on the brand new uh, Z690 platform. So the Z690 Dark Kimby motherboard and the 12900K and obviously the 12600KF which I purchased from a local store. So uh, the platform is definitely uh, easy to overclock on LN2 compared to the uh, previous platforms. So you don't really need any of the voltages to go to full board temperatures. The only difficult thing on the uh, platform that I experienced so far is the initial, the first memory training that you try to do when you go on LN2, like you pull down to minus 80, minus 100, minus 120. It's uh, quite difficult to post and boot the memory settings you were using like on air or water cooling. So, uh, and the main like uh, voltage that affects that posting is the uh, IMC voltage, which is mainly the VDDQ this time and not the system agent voltage. System agent, I always even just left at auto. It wasn't the voltage that affected the most. The VDDQ is the hardest one because it cannot be too high and it cannot be too low. So when I was uh, using like memory sticks on air, uh, when I was trying to run like similar speeds, what I used on air or water cooling, like 6800 to 7000 with common rate one on Hynix based DDR5 sticks, the VDDQ had to be between 1.25 and 1.3 volts. If I used too high, like over 1.3, as I used over 1.3 on water, it would never post. And sometimes it's very, or it was very tricky. Like if I set 1.25, it didn't want to post that happily. But if I set it to 1.26, it did post after a few attempts and I could run it like fully stable in the operating system. So uh, the only thing come, the only like difficulty comes from that uh, voltage. The CPU itself was quite good. Like uh, the P cores of the, of the 12900K, which was doing uh, like, at around almost 5.5 gigahertz of water, the P cores, the maximum speed for the P cores was uh, around 6.9 gigahertz. When I used uh, just the P cores, so E cores disabled, the maximum speed was like 6.88 and I was almost passing 6.895, so very close to 6.9. The E cores were quite good as well. I could run 5.4 on the E cores uh, and, and actually even a bit over 5.4. But as the P cores give the most performance, this CPU cannot do the rank one scores in the various tests that are often compared on sites like hardware bots. So Geekbench 3, Cinebench R20, GPU Pi, X265, 4K, and so on. So uh, now as there are even some retail a very, some very good retail CPUs out there. The target, if you really want to even have a chance on rank one scores, you need 6.95 gigahertz in, uh, in tests like Cinebench R20, Geekbench 3 and so on. So the level of quality uh, we need to have a chance on the very top scores is just so high, that's obviously extremely difficult. So if you, if just a normal user wants to jump into this game, wants to run some uh, overclocking on LN2, the level of quality needed is insanely high. That's why many people uh, have lost interest on extreme overclocking at the high level. Like, I mean, uh, high level means with the newest items. That's why there are so many people uh, in the community that only do extreme overclocking with old hardware, like 775, 3066 old AMD, because they are easy to obtain when you can just bin tons of different CPUs for very low money per CPU. That's one of the main reasons many people are only doing like old hardware and not the newest hardware at all because the prices of the newest, especially newest graphics cards is so high many people can't afford them. The CPUs have technically come down a little bit in price. We have a lot better CPUs now for the same amount of money what we had to pay for simple quad-core CPUs five years ago. The CPUs are cheaper, yes. Motherboards are more expensive because nowadays motherboards need to be able, they need to be better in short words. So we need better VRMs and so on. You can't just uh, produce like uh, Z690 motherboards for as low amount of money as you could uh, like eight years ago. So the, the motherboard prices have gone up. 
And of course, many people still can't find DDR5 that easily, as DDR5 is still uh, quite limited and the price is also quite high. But yeah, so pretty good scores with the 1200k. When uh, I did the scores, I got like rank 3 score. Or well, I mean, I got rank 2 score in Cdbench R11.5. Of course, that's not that compared test anymore. Or well, as it doesn't uh, reward any global points on hardware bot that has uh, switched to uh, R15 many years ago already and now only R20 rewards you points. The most rewarding category with, the, with these Alder Lake CPUs is the P-Core only category. So with the 1200K, the most rewarding category is the P-Core only category. So 8 cores, 16 threads. And for the 8-core uh, category, Cinebench R20, I got a score of uh, 11,028 I think, so that's around 6.9 GHz and that was a rank 3 score at the time of posting the scores. With e -calls enabled I was also able to do over 15,000 in Cinebench R20, but it's not enough because for some reason Splave has very high efficiency on his R20 score. I don't know if it's bugged or is there some secret because he doesn't have the same level of efficiency on the P core only Cinebench R20 and not on the other uh, submissions. The Geekbench 3, I had huge issues at the beginning with the uh, operating system I wanted to use. So I got some uh, like stripped down operating system, but, what, but it was very, very bad. Uh, it was tremendously bad in, in Geekbench 3. I had a lot better performance with just retail operating system tuned than my, with my normal methods. So uh, I would have to look at the operating system uh, thingy myself later. And so the Geekbench 3 score was like 83,000 and almost 300 points, some, somewhere around that mark at 6.9 gigahertz. The memory was quite good. I was able to go even above 7000 megahertz, quite a lot over 7000 megahertz actually, uh, with the uh, Corsair sticks, even just on air cooling with CAS31 and Command Rate 1. So, so the Corsair, so the kit from Corsair, these vengeance sticks, they are very, very good. Then I just tried like validation briefly, but I think uh, after the uh, drama with the high cookies uh, like uh, validations the latest version of CPU-Z is quite annoying it doesn't accept any validation if you are not running all of the available uh, P cores so I could validate 7.5 gigahertz on two of the individual cores but uh, if I try to validate using just a single core it will always give rejected no matter what frequency I wanted to run and I think, it, I, I think it even gave rejected, even if you uh, validated without the XOC mode. So uh, with just like single core running at a, at a safe speed, even at stock CPU, it would give rejected. So that's a quite annoying feature, I, if you ask me. So now you need to run with the latest version, you need to run all of the available cores. And that's quite annoying because if you look at the top like validations from other people, like from Splave, and even if you watch the Bowers videos about validations, they only select single core in the uh, task manager uh, CPU affinity. So technically they are just overlocking one single individual uh, core or thread to the desired frequency and all of the other cores are running at a lower speed. If you look at the validation made by Splave, only the, uh, is it the core number uh, 7 or 8 or 6, that was validated at 7.6 and the rest of the cores were running at a very low speed. So the score I was able to validate was 7.4 on across all of the 8 P cores. So that was 7.4 across all of the 8 P cores without uh, hyperthreading or E cores being running. But just that's what I wanted to say, so that's why validations are very annoying and I don't like them very much. The main thing I was trying to test was what, what could be like the maximum speed in some uh, low workload test like SuperPi 32M or 3D Mark 2001. And I found out that two cores are pretty good, like 7.5 validations. Maybe they could run like SuperPi and 3D Mark 2001 at over 7.3. Don't know. 3D, uh, 3D Mark 2001 I haven't run in a while. I would have to test that more myself later. But that's pretty much it anyways for the 12900K. So definitely a good CPU, but not good enough for the rank 1 scores, sadly. 
The 12600KF was uh, a pretty average CPU from the get-go. It could run 6.6 .6 on the P cores, at least for GPU Pi, 1 billion and so on, but that's pretty much it. So uh, it's already like 200 megahertz behind the rank 1 CPUs, uh, like the one from Bullshooter. So it definitely cannot even, it doesn't have any chance on the rank 1 scores, sadly, but it was just like an average performer uh, all around. Eco wise also like 5.2 something. So uh, I will uh, just sell this CPU. It's probably just decent enough on air or water cooling. I didn't even lap it because there's no need. You, sh you should never lap a CPU that is not like good enough because then it will definitely void the warranty. The only good thing which I still want to mention about the 1200K was the cache. So the cache of this particular CPU was very very good. I could go up to 6.2 gigahertz on the cache on this particular uh, 1200K. That's a very high value. The highest I've seen on uh, the i9 variants of the Alder Lake CPUs have been around 6.1 and 6.2 and only on a very few selected CPUs. Usually people run between 5.6 and 6 gigahertz on the cache. But sadly that doesn't really matter because the cache doesn't really affect performance at that much at all. So many people don't even try to max it out. So it doesn't matter if the cache is at 5.7, 5.8, 5.9 or even 6 gigahertz, the performance will be roughly the same. The only real performance comes from the, uh, well the most important are the P cores, then the E cores and then the memory. And cache is like number four in the uh, list of in, in the list of importance. But yeah, so that's pretty much it. So the overall like the session didn't go that very well for that part of the whole testing. There are still many of the voltages that are present from the previous like generations like the core PLL, that's the internal CPU PLL from ASUS and so on. The value, the voltage we usually set to 1.1 volts to move like weird clock walls, that voltage still exists. It's uh, 0 0.9 by default. I tested between 0 0.9 and 1.3, didn't really uh, affect my maximum clock speed at all. Some CPUs might need that voltage for cold, uh, I mean for full pot action, but uh, it, just in my case I didn't see any benefit from that voltage. So both of these CPUs could go to full pot pretty much without any of the sub voltages. The only, again, the only like difficult voltage is the VDDQ because it has to be set correctly if you want to be able to post and boot good memories. Uh, like successfully. The add-on PLL might be uh, worthwhile to set to 1.1 if you are facing issues with uh, like cold bugging but uh, it's very it's very CPU dependent. So I might do like a separate a very short BIOS overview regarding these settings later. But uh, yeah so pretty easy overall so uh, in that regard it was quite easy. The only good thing about the whole session was definitely the uh, Time Spy Extreme uh, record score in uh, the single GPU category. The efficiency of the run wasn't very good. I had better efficiency with some of my older runs. So uh, I still need to work on that uh, more later. But of course we have the RTX 3090 Ti coming out to the market at the end of this month. So uh, the 3090 isn't going to be around uh, in the very best scores that very long time anyways. 14,619 points. I've been trying that score for a very long time. I already posted a short video where I proved the score as it was uh, on the display and showed you the Hall of Fame list and so on. The uh, only thing I really want to fix is the full pot speed or uh, the full pot and thermal paste cracking on these graphics cards because it's very annoying and it's not very consistent at all. The, when I always got the uh, surface better and better and better on the GPU die, like the thermal paste spread was just so good, the cracking sometimes went even worse. And uh, the heat does help you a little bit, like uh, using like the uh, Kimping Cooling uh, GPU Inferno, it does help a little bit, but the heat is needed more towards like efficiency. If the memory chips get too cold, the performance drops dramatically. So the uh, traffic score in Time Spike Stream might drop from like 14,100 to 13,200. So uh, you, you need the heat more for efficiency, not so much for the actual like uh, thermal paste cracking and so on. The thermal paste cracking, I'm sure it comes more from the uh, 
shrinking of the container. Like when you get too cold, as, as it always happens at idle for me, it all 95% of the time the thermal base cracking happens at idle. The usual case is you crash during a benchmark run, like crash and boom, a thermal base crack afterwards. So uh, it has to come from the shrinking for the most part. So that's why I think why the Cryonaut Extreme thermal paste has the best like performance for thermal paste cracking because it's a very dense thermal paste. So uh, or that's more like guessing. So uh, that's the main thing I want to fix. I don't really care so much if I'm uh, if my score is at rank 1, rank 2 or rank 3. I just would like to run like a constant full pot for very long periods of time so that I could really test the new GPU container from Kimping Cooling because the newest Tech9 Icon Extreme it doesn't really give it doesn't really give you any benefit if you uh, can't get to full pot like uh, constantly. So that's what I'm uh, working on, and obviously let's see what what happens with the RTX 3090 Ti. Like, is it easier in this regard? Is it easier for thermal paste cracking? Is it easier for uh, like uh, memory? Uh, efficiency and stability when going on cold that's still a question mark at this point so we'll see but yeah so the next thing I'm trying with the uh, Z690 Dark Kimpin uh, is the uh, the so-called famous LGA 1700 mod so using the washes between the uh, motherboard's PCB and the mounting mechanism does it give you any any benefit I want to cover this topic with you guys because it's already known I've seen it myself already the uh, socket clamp mechanism on the LGA1700 socket is quite bad. They're, they should have the same mounting mechanism or clamping mechanism what's present on the X socket. So X299, X99, so a lever on both sides. But I think they went for this option because it's much cheaper. So there's way too much pressure on this side of the uh, uh, clamping mechanism. So uh, the CPU is actually bent, the center is lower than these edges and that's the main part what some of you were telling in the comments about my lapping video. So yes, it's absolutely correct to be able to get a perfect lapping end result on this platform and it affects to other platforms as well. You would have to cut some dead motherboard, so the whole socket away from a dead motherboard and lap the CPU while it's clamped in the socket. Then you would get a perfect end result. But that's what I will be trying anyways next on my channel. And I also have a Corsair Samsung based. So Samsung I see DDR5 sticks coming in very very soon. I think they should be here during this week. And then I will also try the uh, Zezani uh, CPU the 5300G I have that uh, I have that one as well but sadly that's not the uh, like king of the hill CPU anymore because the non K overclocking is present on these good C690 motherboards with external clock generator so all of the uh, like low end cheap CPUs from Intel like the i3 and locked i5s they will be dominating the leaderboards in the dual core and quad core category. So sad day for the 5300G. It will be taken over by Core i3 12100 and 12300. So we will be testing the non-K as well later on this motherboard and just interested just interested to see how that actually performs. So stay tuned for all of, all of those videos. They will be coming out soon on my channel. And uh, yeah, extreme overclocking is never easy. So uh, not every session goes that well, but uh, still happy that I could have the rank one score in both of the Time Spike Stream uh, single and dual GPU categories at least once in my lifetime. That's the most important, anyways. No record lasts forever. They will be taken over, anyways, when a new generation comes out to the market. The previous top scores made with the old generation will be taken over, anyways. But yeah, so uh, thanks for watching this video if you uh, had interest on hearing about my comments about these runs and uh, subscribe to my channel and stay tuned for my next video and thanks for watching and I'll see you on the next one.